pay for. So the 133 billion, I think, is a figure which is already incorporated into the forecast in terms of the forecast for debt interest costs and for the change in the level of public sector net debt. So in a sense, the autumn statement is delivering the Chancellor's fiscal rules mm. with that with that forecast reflected, although I think as the ABR say in the document and I think said in their evidence mm. to you yesterday, it is very uncertain because the biggest driver of um, the forecast is the difference between mm. bank rate and the interest rate that the government is paying on the debt that is now held by the bank, yeah. um, which was bought obviously over a period of years from, from 2008. So it's very particularly uncertain it's because it's the, the movements between those two different two different rates. It's it's a niche issue, but it's very substantive in terms of the numbers. So that's why I wanted to raise it. But I now want to turn to the um, 2019 manifesto um, on which you, Chancellor, were elected, on which I was elected, and um, and colleagues on this committee were um, uh, the conservative ones were elected because the Prime Minister has uh, made uh, it. Um, emphatically a number of times the point that uh, he wants to stick to that manifesto as much as possible. Um, we've obviously already breached the manifesto commitment to the world's poorest and um, I wondered if you could talk about the other manifesto commitment that I think was broken in the autumn statement, which is the commitment that you won't have to sell your house to pay for care. Can you talk about your thinking around that? Um, well, it's obviously an area that I am very familiar with from my time as Health Secretary and indeed as Chair of the Health and Social Care Select Committee. And uh, I want to say straight up that I support the Dilmot reforms. I think that um, they make a very big difference to a certain category of family who are affected by what are called catastrophic care costs, normally a, a neurological condition that means that someone is incapacitated for a very long time, has very high cost of their care being delivered. And so I was keen to proceed with those reforms, um, but I also looked at the overall pressures in local government, the overall pressures in the social care system, and the pressures in the NHS. And the pressures in the NHS have been particularly exacerbated by something that wasn't the case when we made those manifesto commitments, which is a once in a century pandemic, which has put extreme pressure on the NHS. And as a result of that, the NHS has seven million people on its waiting list, that's mm -hmm. their own estimate. And I don't think we can make progress in bringing that, numbers, that number down if around 13,500 NHS beds are occupied by people mm -hmm. who should be being looked after in the community. So the difficult decision I took was to put nearly five billion pounds of extra spending capacity into the social care system, of which about a third of the cost comes from delaying the implementation of the Dilmot reforms, and I decided that was going to give the most direct help to people in need of health and care over the next two years. So you accept that it was a breach of the manifesto pledge, but you had to make difficult decisions. That's e effectively what I'm hearing. Can I turn to another um, possible? Well, you're, you're trying to, if I may say, um, you know, it was, I think, a delay. Mm in implementing a manifesto pledge on the basis of the extreme circumstances we had with the pandemic. Mm. And I think given that, that the result of that, mm. along with extra money coming from the Treasury mm. and extra support from local councils, is a nearly five billion pound increase in the social care budget, which is, I think, from memory, around 200,000 additional care packages. I think that was the balanced decision to take in the circumstances. But by putting it off until after the next election, you do run the risk that it's never implemented. Well, um, I understand people might have those concerns. I should also say that local authorities themselves, mm -hmm. we received a number of representations saying that they didn't mm -hmm. feel that they were ready to implement it ahead of the next election. And uh, I, I do think that there is a very extreme situation facing the NHS and care system, and it was important to take action pretty decisively in the autumn statement. So uh, another 
um, manifesto commitment was not to raise uh, the rates of income tax. Now, um, you haven't raised the rates of income tax unless you're making between 125,000 and 150,000. Was that a footnote in the manifesto? Well, um, the, the basic rates of income tax have not been raised. The thresholds have been raised and the threshold at which you pay the 45B rate has been reduced dramatically. And I don't think I made any, uh, any attempt whatsoever mm. to hide in the autumn statement that this was 25 billion pounds of tax rises um, because it was a package of tax rises and spending cuts. And I was very open about that. Okay. If you ask me why I didn't choose to raise headline rates of taxation. That's because I believe in cutting taxes as a Conservative and I want to bring those headline rates down over time mm. and I decided that although it's, there's an element of symbolism, it's actually mm. important symbolism that I want to bring those rates down and that's why I decided that it was better to do it through the thresholds. Okay, just a couple of other quick questions. Um, have you allocated enough to the Home Office and the NHS to allow those other manifesto commitments about the 20,000 more police, the 40 new hospitals and the 50,000 additional nurses to, and the, uh, the, the uh, other commitments along those lines. Is there enough money in the system to achieve those manifesto objectives? Well, there are pressures on all government departments because of inflation that wasn't expected. And we are going through a process of working through with all government departments mm -hmm. how they're going to manage those pressures. But with the Home Office in particular, um, the, uh, <laughs> even after the decisions in the autumn statements, their annual uh, increase in budget is going to, or their budget is going to increase by 3.1% in real terms every year of this parliament. So they've seen um, a substantial increase. The uh, Ministry of Justice is near a 4%. Mm. Okay, thanks. Um, turning to capital budgets, um, just two very quick questions on that. Uh, first of all, um, in terms of an explicit commitment you made to HS2 and um, delivering that up to Manchester and keeping that capital commitment in the budget, um, uh, were you able to have a look at the policy exchange report that suggested that most of the benefits would come from doing Old Oak Common to Birmingham? Was that something that you looked at or that... Um, uh, you know, because there are obviously colleagues who um, aren't particularly happy about the capital spending being allocated to HS2. Well, I um, decided to proceed with HS2 to Manchester for two reasons. Uh, firstly, because we have long had in this country infrastructure that is inferior to peer countries uh, with respect to both our rail and our road network. And I think if we want to be the most prosperous economy in Europe, uh, we have to sort out these problems. And I still think we've got profound difficulties in the way we execute large infrastructure projects. And I think it's something we need to come back to as a country. But my other reason is because I think that our failure to have good national infrastructure is one of the key reasons why we have such large regional imbalances in wealth. And you know, if you look at our country, we have a much greater concentration of wealth and high living standards in London and the South East relative to other parts of the country uh, as compared to um, countries like Germany. And one of the ways that you deal with that is by having good transport links that mean that if you want to benefit from those higher standards of living, you don't have to move down to London. You can stay living uh, up north and you can travel easily other parts of the country when you need to. So I think having good uh, connections between our countries is one of the central ways in which we spread wealth and opportunity across the country. And within capital spending, I speak as a representative of a constituency that's quite flood prone along the River Severn. Are you maintaining the capital commitment to flood defences? We are going through all our capital commitments now. Uh, what I managed to do, uh, it was a big priority for me in deciding the autumn statement to avoid cuts in spending that would damage future growth. I think protecting people from floods is an, is an important thing to do because of the damage to economic growth if people are flooded. But we aren't specifically making commitments to individual areas until we've been through that process. What I managed to do 
was to protect capital spend broadly at its current levels in cash terms, um, but we aren't increasing it by as much as we were planning to do. That means it's still going to continue at around double the level it was a decade ago, which I think is very important given what I was talking about earlier. Um, and we want to do as many of the major projects as we can, and certainly all the ones that are strategic to our growth plans. Thank you, Chancellor. And please note my interest in uh, capital spending on flood defences. Uh, Danny. Thank you, Chair. Mm. Uh, afternoon, Chancellor. Can I ask you about fis the fiscal rules? So we've now got our, I think, sixth set uh, since, since 2010. What do you think the real value of having fiscal rules is at all? And how can we have a confidence in these latest ones? Well, um, the point about the structures we have is that people want to know uh, some basic truths about our approach to public finances, that we understand that in the end you can't spend money you haven't got, um, and that we are a country that is going to repay our debts. And the purpose of the structures we have is to allow the Chancellor of the Exchequer to make commitments and then the independent OBR assesses whether those are credible and true. So we do change our fiscal rules. Chancellors do change fiscal rules from time to time. I think that it is reasonable to change the time period at which our fiscal rules operate from three years to five years, given that we're dealing with a once in a century pandemic and uh, an energy crisis that is the biggest since the 1970s. Um, but I think people still want to know that there is a serious intention to reduce our debt. Um, and yeah. so that's why I think it is important to have fiscal rules. Okay, thank you. I mean, it, it is helpful to have them because it means that we can hold you to account uh, for the trajectory you're on. Um, <coughs> but they're very tight, these, the, the rules we've now set, with a, particularly with the headroom that, that the OBR have said you've got, uh, £9 billion. Pounds. And it's all predicated on stable interest rates and falling energy costs. We had the OBR in yesterday and we were asking them why they are so confident that energy costs are going to fall over the course of the next year, because if they don't, it's going to be very difficult to meet the, uh, to meet the rules and to, uh, and to do what you're saying. So can you explain to us why you are confident uh, that the, uh, the energy costs are going to come down so dramatically uh, as they need to in order for the, uh, for the rules to be met? Well, I think we have to accept that in a period of massive global instability, there is uncertainty in any forecast. Um, and the OBR has as good a record as anyone. Normally, their forecasts are broadly in the middle of the pack of, of, of all the economic forecasters. Um, but they're very open about the fact that there's a range of outcomes. The headroom in the final year is only ten point, is 9.1 billion. So it's, it, you're absolutely right, it's very small. And um, I think what we have to do is to, if we're going to be sensible about this, have a central scenario based on our best guess of what's going to happen to energy prices, um, produce a set of accounts that's based on that, but recognise that when it comes to the spring budget, when it comes to next year's autumn statement, these things may change. Okay, well, let me, can I just put to you what you would do in, in that scenario? So. If, if, if you don't have the money that you're thinking you're going to have at the moment, you know, already our taxes are at the highest since the Second World War, our debt is at the highest since the Second World War. It feels inconceivable that we could increase either of those substantially. So the only change that is feasible is, is spending reductions. Do you accept that that is indeed the path that we would have to be on if we didn't meet the, uh, the expectations that have been set out this month? I think... I appreciate it's, you have made some spending reductions, but still, yeah. we are some, spending is rising over the course of the, the, the autumn statement period. Is that sustainable? I think it's difficult to predict how you would react in a hypothetical situation. It's not just a sort of politician trying to duck hypothetical answers, but I think it is genuinely difficult um, if the forecasts moved against us, if, if you know energy prices went up again, mm. um, if there was a a big hole in our accounts. I think, it, depending on the challenge you face, your, your reaction might be different. But I don't think it's sensible to speculate exactly what you would do because you don't exactly know what the problem will be. And I just think you have to be honest with people and say the situation might change. 
and your response might have to change. But on the basis of the facts as they appear to now, and they appear to be most likely, um, I think we have a good plan, the right plan, brings down inflation, shows that we can uh, balance our books and repay our debts. Um, but we have to be honest with people that things can change in the wrong direction. And you had a quick question on this. I'm going to ask a few questions, if I may, but very, very quickly, Chancellor. First of all, good afternoon, and can I just say thanks for showing, um, a, you know, a, the compassionate side with regards to your autumn statement by maintaining the link with um, benefits and inflation, um, accepting the low pay commission recommendations, but also the business with the triple lock. In a way, staying with the um, fiscal targets, um, I sense from the autumn statement you also share my scepticism, and indeed members around this, this, in this committee, about the value of forecasting. Um, you, have to, you have to attach a certain um, importance to them, but you know, as Galbraith said, you know, forecasting, economic forecasting is, is, is only there to make um, you know, um, astrology look respectable. Um, do, where do you, in, in making your um, estimates and, and suggesting your targets within the Treasury, where do you go with regards to the forecast? Is it mostly the OBR, is it the, is it the Bank of England, or is it the, a Treasury unit, or a combination of the three? Um, well, obviously, I listened very carefully to the bank's forecasts and the OBR's forecasts, but I think my observation would be that there's only one thing worse than a forecast, and that's not having a forecast. Mm. And I think it is really important as a discipline, even though you're aware of the likely inaccuracy of any forecast, I think your starting point has to be what is most likely to happen on the basis of the information we have now. But you have to be, uh, you have to recognize that there's a, a fan of outcomes mm. if you visualize what the graphs look like, and there's a sensitivity in the analysis. But um, there's less sensitivity, if I can put it this way, Mr. Barron, in the overall direction of travel. I think we can know from the uh, forecast that we have from the OBR and the Bank of England that we are likely to be in recession, uh, that we are likely to be spending more on energy, that we are likely to be faced with uh, an increasing tax bill and more pressure on public spending. And so even if you don't know exactly what that pressure is, you can react to the direction of travel and broadly prepare the country, prepare people for the fact that there are some difficult decisions that you have to you take. Know that, does it not worry you a little bit? You say we're, you know, there's forecast, there's a broad consensus, but I don't remember a time, and I was working in the city before I came into politics, where there's been so much disparity in the official forecasts. I mean, for example, you know, the OBR is forecasting overall growth of 2.5% between 22 and 25, and yet the Bank of England is projecting a shrinkage of 2% um, if it raises interest rates that the market expects, or at least a shrinkage of half a percent if they stay where they are. I mean, that is a big disparity um, when you're trying to project targets, whether they be fiscal or not, isn't it? It is, but I think both of those still the overall picture is a period where it's going to be much more difficult for the government to raise the kinds of sums of money that it's used to raising and therefore we have to be responsible with our finances and the single biggest thing we can do to reduce the pressure on public finances is to bear down on inflation because uh, so many of uh, our costs as a government are index linked and I would just say, if you look in the near term, so I think a lot of concern people had about those forecasts was, you know, are you going to embark on a big consolidation when actually the forecast might be wrong? I think in the near term, what the OBR say is that the measures that I announced on Thursday make the recession shallower, uh, make the increase in unemployment less by about 70,000. And so, you know, in the near term, I'm confident that we're doing the right thing. Final question, if I may. I mean, you, you will perhaps understand the scepticism within the committee or certain members of the committee when it comes to the track record of, of forecasting. Um, you know, there is clear evidence that forecasts have been inaccurate in the past. You know, initially inflation wasn't a problem, then when, uh, but despite clear evidence of that, 
then when it became a problem, clearly evident, it was going to be transitory, then it was going to fall away. I mean, there's a bad picture here that doesn't inspire confidence going forward. Is, does the Treasury, to what extent is the Treasury actually undertaking its own in-depth research as to say, for example, the drivers of inflation, the medium-term drivers, such as you know, shortened business supply lines, aging demographics, um, climate change disruption, um, in, in order to try to improve the accuracy of forecasts going forward, because this is an important area to try and get right as much as possible. Well, I, I agree with that. Um, I would say that the correct response to the inaccuracy of forecasts is to try and make them more accurate, mm -hmm. not to fly blind. Mm -hmm. And in defence of the OBR, their forecasting record has been more accurate than the record of the Treasury that was doing those forecasts before the OBR existed. Mm -hmm. um, I think it is important for uh, ministers to take their own views. They look at forecasts by other organisations, they take their own view. My judgment is uh, that, you know, looking at the range of forecasts, um, a consolidation in our national finances was necessary to bring down inflation, which is the number one threat to stability in the economy, and that's why I took the decisions I did. But I would be very honest with people, there are a range of outcomes. None of us know what's going to happen next in Ukraine, and therefore none of us know what's going to happen to international energy prices, and we have to be honest that uh, that uncertainty means that decisions may change in either direction in the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you, John. Rishinara. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chancellor. Uh, just to be clear, it's not a unanimous view, the scepticism about OBR forecasting. So Mr. Marin is, uh, doesn't, uh, we don't share, we don't all share his views, just to be clear. Um, so, so, Chancellor, uh, you've been, you, you, you've obviously been focused on stabilising the economy after what happened in February, in part because the Chancellor, your predecessor and the former Prime Minister chose to fly blind and make announcements, uh, economic announcements, uh, without an OBR forecast. So I just want to take you back to where we are at the moment. The OECD has warned that the UK will be the lowest, gro have the lowest growth among the big group of seven industrial countries next year. Only Russia facing sanctions from the West over its attack on Ukraine will perform worse. Uh, the OBR has uh, reported that living standards will fall by 7% over the next two years. And the Governor of the Bank of England to this committee and elsewhere has said, uh, mentioned the differences between the UK and, uh, and Eurozone. Eurozone growth rates are 2.1%, US growth rate 4.2%, and yet the UK economy is 0.7% smaller than at the start of the pandemic. And by, just to finish off, uh, by 2024, people's disposable incomes will, be, will have gone back to 2013 levels, and we are likely to see, by 2027 and 28, a third of people's disposable income being reduced per capita. So we've seen all of this happen over a number of years, particularly over the last, uh, over those crucial few months, uh, credibility issues are credibility uh, on the line internationally. And somebody described, I forget who it is, that the British people are paying a moral premium, a moron premium, not a moral premium, a moron <laughs> premium is being paid by the British public. What's the point of having the Conservatives in government with that legacy, Chancellor? Well, and I appreciate you've inherited a poison chalice, but on behalf of your government over the last 12 years, perhaps you can explain to the British public what the point is of your party in government. Well, I'm going to answer that question in a less party political way than it was asked. Um, because you can your take... Your party has been in power well, for 12 years, with respect. Ms. Ali, will you let me answer your no, question? Because I would like to do. give you a proper answer. Um, you can take a snapshot of economic statistics to tell you any story you like. So you can look at this year's growth, and the UK is the fastest in the G7. You can look at next year's, and we're one of the slowest, according to some projections. If you take, if you say, what's the, long, what's the point of my party? I would say, well, since we've been in office in 2012, we have the third highest growth in the G7, which is something since 2010. Since 2010. Yeah. We have the third highest, thank you for that, Chair. Um, we have the third highest growth in the G7. And that is over a period when we've had three global shocks, 
um, to contend with the financial crisis, the pandemic, um, and the energy crisis. And mm. so I think that's a record that we can defend very comfortably. If you look at more recent but longer period of time, the OECD report that you talked about says that since 2020, mm. we have had the fastest uh, of any G7 country, the fastest recovery from the pandemic. Um, but I think there are some very big economic challenges we face that are not related necessarily to those shocks, and I am very keen to address those. So I am concerned that employment is still, from memory, 334,000 lower than pre-pandemic, when in a number of our peer countries, employment levels are back to what they were pre-pandemic. That's why I asked Mel Stride, the Work and Pension Secretary, uh, to, or he's doing a review, in fact, for the Prime Minister, uh, to look at the issue of workforce participation. There are many issues that relate to that, you know, the way the benefit system works, childcare arrangements, the decision to retire early, and he's, he's doing that. Okay. I think we've got some long-term issues over productivity. Um, that's why in my autumn statement I spent some time talking about the skills challenges we face. Um, where I think we've had a lot of initiatives, but there's still a lot of progress to make. So I don't, for one second, say that there isn't a lot of work to be done, but I don't agree with your overall suggestion that over the period of time that my party has been in office, uh, we haven't grown uh, impressively given the challenges we face. Uh, we'll, we'll agree to disagree. Uh, can I take you on to uh, the OBR um, figures that state that between by 2024 to 25, the tax burden will be at its highest level since the Second World War. Can you talk us through what the impact of such a high tax burden will be on economic growth? Well, I'm very concerned that if taxes are too high, it makes it difficult to be a modern dynamic economy. And I'm concerned about the effect on incentives <laughs> And I am a Conservative who believes you should bring taxes down. So if you look at what the OBR said, uh, two of the biggest drivers of that increasing cost are debt interest payments, which are now £120 billion a year. That's uh, around double the entire budget of the Ministry of Defence. Uh, that's uh, a massive increase from around £40 billion from memory down before the pandemic. So that's one of the big things. And the other big thing is health and care costs, yep. where uh, the ageing population has had led to a surge in growth. What do we do to bring those tax rates down? And I th from memory, I think the forecast projections show that tax as a proportion of GDP goes down from 47% to 43% over the forecast um, period. But what do we do? First of all, on debt interest, the key thing is to bring down inflation. Um, bear down on interest rates or support the Bank of England so that they can bear down on interest rates to reduce those debt repayments and to bring down our debt levels. And that's one of the most important reasons why we announced that difficult consolidation. And when it comes to the NHS, I think the answer is real public service reform um, because I think the British people want a good, strong NHS. They want to know that every penny is being spent wisely. And that's why we invited uh, Patricia Hewitt to review the way the new integrated care boards work, which are the new structures that are going to determine how the NHS is run, to make sure that we can uh, reduce the micromanagement and targets, which I happen to believe drive a lot of the inefficiency, and really empower local decision making and better use of every pound we spend. So can I just on health then, since you brought it up, uh, there are 7 million people waiting. About 117,000 people have died while waiting for treatment. Uh, do, you, do you believe that the changes, and then we've got 400,000 people who are economically inactive. Mm. One of our witnesses said two days ago that that could be a hit of about 0.7% on economic output. That's pretty serious. Do you believe that the investment you're putting in and these reforms that you're proposing, whatever they may be, uh, that's going to be able to bring people back into the economy, those who are willing to work, who are not active because of health issues. Can you, can you give us an assurance that that's going to happen and by when do, you, do we, given your expertise in health 
health care, both as former health secretary as well as select committee chair, can we see those groups? Because that has a bearing on migration as well, if we want to keep migration down. Well, that, that is why we put a uh, £8 billion pound package Is it going to happen, though? Are we going to be able to get those people who are in economically inactive with that investment? Well, that, that is, sorry, just to sure. start to answer again, that is the purpose of putting in £8 billion pounds a year. In a context where you are consolidating by £55 billion pounds in tax rises and spending cuts, to, to choose to put £8 billion pounds into yep. the NHS and social care system is to say you're prepared to have £8 billion more of cuts elsewhere or £8 billion of tax rises elsewhere to fund it. But if we think it's the right thing to do. Yes, because first of all, we are absolutely committed to the NHS and we want to have first-class health and care in this country, and we think that's what voters want. But secondly, absolutely, because the NHS has a yeah. crucial role in helping get people better and get people back into the workforce. Fortunately, the, uh, the, the voters aren't getting the first-class health care that they deserve, mm. and it's good to hear that you are... You are taking your health expertise into the Treasury. Well, I mean, uh, they are not getting it. Uh, people are uh, not getting GPs appointments. They're not getting seen uh, for their treatment. You know about the cases. You've seen it over the years in the ch as chair of the Select Committee. So as the I've written a book about now, it as okay. well, Miss Ali. But what I would say is that uh, yes, of course, there are major challenges the NHS is facing. But I think it did a. Saying it's could good I possibly your answer your question? I've got one um, final, yeah, final but question. But I think possible. it's important to recognise the NHS did an absolutely fantastic job yep. in the pandemic, um, and uh, they are having to recover from the biggest external shock to their services in the history of the NHS. I'll pay and that's you why a backhanded compliment, Chancellor, that it's good that you're in the you're in the Treasury given your health background. One final question: the Resolution Foundation has said that since the pandemic, the net result that uh, is that lo total long-term spending plans are largely unchanged since the start of the pandemic, leaving the consolidation entirely driven by tax rises. Are you comfortable with that? Um, the consolidation was a combination of tax rises. Um, what I announced in the autumn statement, I think, increases tax as a proportion of GDP by about 1% and reductions in planned spending uh, to a long-term rate of around 1% in real terms a year. It was planned to go up by much more than that. Now, I think that's going to put pressure on spending because we know in areas like the NHS, it's highly unlikely that you'll be able to contain the growth in spending at 1%. So I, I don't pretend this isn't anything but going to be challenging, but we are absolutely committed to public services and that's why we took the decision to find extra money for schools and extra money for the NHS uh, to make sure that they are protected through the worst of a difficult period. Thank you. Thanks Rishinara. Anthony. Uh, thank you Chair. So I think we all agree across the House and across the party uh, that uh, we need more economic growth. Uh, your predecessor in his growth plan, he obviously prioritised growth at all costs, didn't work out. Uh, in your uh, autumn statements, you've uh, prioritised balancing the books first. Um, but in the, the OBR projects that overall growth will be 2.5% between 2022 and 2025, uh, so less than 1% a year as we go into recession and then out of it. Um, is that good enough? I think we need a long-term growth rate that is... Uh, closer to 3% than 2%. Um, but to get there is going to take uh, a combination of short-term support to help the economy weather the recession. And that's why the measures that we announced on Thursday, I think, do that. They reduce the peak to trough um, reduction in GDP uh, from about 3% to 2.1%. Uh, so I think that's important but also some structural changes. And I think the structural changes uh, revolve in a lot of areas that I touched on in the autumn statement, but in terms of investing in people, I think the skills, the education and skills agenda is so important, which is why <coughs> Michael Barber's doing his review on whether we're achieving our objectives on skills, why we put the extra money into schools. But also we need to look at um, the leveling up agenda and how we are better at spreading wealth throughout the country, and that's why it was important to me to protect key infrastructure projects, which is one element of, of levelling up. A very major factor for our long-term economic growth 
is going to be a stable source of cheap green energy. And so proceeding with Sizewell, our national energy efficiency ambition are all part of making sure energy doesn't become a mm. energy supply doesn't become a shadow hanging over firms, making them hesitate as to, to whether to invest. Um, but then perhaps most important, I talked about you know, our long-term plan for the UK to become the world's next Silicon Valley. And I think we have a huge Brexit opportunity to set our own regulations in areas like life sciences and technology and AI, gene editing, um, so that we can make the UK the must-go-to destination for all the research, all the embryo companies um, that uh, want to invest in these very exciting areas that are going to determine the future. So it's a mixture of short-term and long-term. Yeah, and a lot of the measures you mentioned there were sort of long-term, and indeed you did talk about them in the autumn statements, but in terms of the actual measures in the autumn statement, the OBR has analysed the impact on uh, growth on the supply side uh, and uh, <coughs> concluded um, that the net effect of the new measures on potential output is neutral over the forecast period, because things like the, the not going ahead with the health and social care levy encourage more people to go into the labour market, but then freezing the tax thresholds uh, reduces that. Uh, the annual investment allowance, keeping it at a million pounds, encourages more business investment, but then some of the changes in our scheme reduce business investment. Overall, they just say it's, it's neutral on growth. Do, do you think they're being too pessimistic? I think a lot of supply-side measures, which I very strongly support, because I think doing things to improve the productive potential of our economy is what a good Conservative government does, um, do take a while. I mean, you know, Economic this growth. Is over, this is over the forecast period, with the, which is which five years. Measure, yeah. But I mean, you know, if I give you an example, the average economic growth rate in the 1980s, when we had all the Thatcher supply side reforms, mm -hmm. was not that much higher than the average growth in the 1970s. But actually, the benefits of those supply side reforms really showed in the decades that followed when Margaret Thatcher wasn't prime minister. I, that's not a reason not to do them. Um, ultimately, if we want to be a highly prosperous, high skill, high wage economy, then we have to be much better at making sure all our people have really good skills in a modern economy. That's a big agenda. Um, I want to make sure we progress on that. <coughs> um, and you know, I want to attract investment from all over the world in high growth industries, but that's a process that I recognize I can make a start on, but isn't going to come to fruition until long after I've gone. The Chancellor, when he, the, the Prime Minister, when he was doing your job, he gave the May's lecture where he uh, identified, like many people, that a long-term economic problem is low productivity, but he in particular said uh, the solution to that is having higher business investment. Uh, but actually business investment has, in, in the UK, has, has no higher, according to the, like these OBR forecasts, will be no higher in 2025 than it was in 2016, so it's actually some... I'm just gone up and down a bit, but basically flat over over a decade. Um, are you disappointed with that performance? And what what can be done to get business? In, I mean, I assume you agree with your boss's analysis on business investment. Uh, what can be done to get out? Well, my boss is absolutely right uh, to <laughs> talk not. about business investment. <laughs> um, uh, I I do absolutely believe that. Um, so um, my priority in the autumn statement was not to do anything that would make it go in the wrong direction. Mm. So the bit that I control as Chancellor is public investment, um, and that principally is around infrastructure, and that's why it was a priority. You also have control over tax policy, which affects business investments as well. That's true, yeah. but my priority in the autumn statement, uh, given the lack of available funding for big tax breaks to encourage business investment, which in ordinary circumstances would be a priority for me, um, the uh, priority was to avoid cutting capital projects or the capital budget in a way that would be detrimental to our long-term investment in the productive potential of the economy. So I think I succeeded in avoiding the big cuts to capital, which are often the first place people go when they're looking for savings in a hurry. Um, I think that was important, but is there more to be done to encourage business investment? Absolutely. But how, how are you going to encourage more business investment then? Well, I think there are lots of things you can do. First of all, you have to make sure that your tax system is competitive and you do as much as you're able to do at any one time to make it competitive. Um, but you can also do things like setting out long-term plans for growth industries like life sciences, technology, green industries that attracts people to come to the UK because 
you know, we're using our Brexit freedoms to allow things to happen uh, with our uh, with forward-looking regulatory structures that you can't do in other countries. Um, so, you know, I look at uh, as I talked about in the autumn statement, I look at Nigel Lawson's Big Bang in 1986. That wasn't something that cost the government any money, but far-reaching regulatory changes attracted enormous investment into UK financial services in the years that followed that, uh, because there was more competition, more innovation. Uh, it was possible to do more things here, and I think that's that demonstrates that you can do th very, very good things, even if you don't have money to spend. You, um, obviously, you have in this uh, autumn statement put taxes up and you need to balance the books and taxes are going up to the highest level for 70 years, as my colleague talked about. Um, but do you accept, you also describe yourself as a low tax conservative, so presumably you accept the longer term beyond this autumn statement. Mm -hmm. You'll need, in, part of encouraging economic growth will be getting taxes down. Absolutely. And, um, and I think that includes business taxes as well. Um, but uh, we absolutely want to do that. I just didn't feel in a context of raising taxes by 25 billion, people would really welcome long-term promises to reduce taxes because we weren't going in that direction in that budget. But I, I do absolutely believe that if you want to have the right culture around enterprise, if you want the dynamism that encourages entrepreneurs and small companies to get off the ground, then having a tax burden, in particular uh, reducing the taxes that people have to pay before they've made a penny's profit, uh, those can be very, very beneficial. One thing that hasn't been much commented on, you, you reversed the, the cut in the basic rate of income tax, or the promised cut, which the, Chancellor, the, the Prime Minister had promised in a couple of years and your predecessor had brought forwards and you've now cancelled it, I think. Um, is, are, are you concerned about the impact that that would have on work incentives and so on? Well, my belief in the importance of work incentives is why I would consider myself a Conservative who wants to bring down taxes. Um, but in this situation, that was one of a number of extremely difficult decisions that I had to take. Um, overall, I decided that the balance should be shared broadly, evenly, between tax cuts and reductions in spending. When it comes to spending, it was mainly redu reductions in planned growth in spending, but there will be some real cuts in spending too. And broadly, I tried to balance business taxes and personal taxes, but um, these were very, very difficult decisions. I don't pretend otherwise. Finally, the, the, your predecessor had a target for how much she wanted to get growth up to, and you, you said in your first answer that you, you prefer growth closer to 3% or 2%, I think is what you put it. You, do you believe in having a, a growth target? It's not something governments, UK governments have traditionally done. I'm not sure whether it's a value to have a growth target, because I think it's really difficult. If you talk about all the measures that we've been talking about, it's very difficult to know precisely what impact they will have cumulatively and what the time scale is. Um, but do I agree with the central insight of my predecessor that the only way we're going to square the circle of paying for decent public services and being a competitive low tax economy is increasing our growth rate? He was absolutely right to say that. I have lots more questions, but no more time. Thank you, Chancellor. Thank you very much, Anthony. Uh, Siobhan, did you want to come in now? Because oh, I know really you've got to thank step you, out Chair. That's really, APPG. really kind yeah. of you. Um, Chancellor, in advance of your autumn statement, you said that those with the broadest shoulders will bear the heaviest burden. And we on that side, this side, including, I hope, Andrea, would agree with that. Um, I've searched high and low through your statement, but I can't seem to find the section on those with the broadest shoulders of all, the non-DOMs. How much would closing the tax loophole for the super-rich raise for the public purse? Well, I've asked the Treasury to look into that. But my, let me say that my concern is, um, I, I think the Labour Party are claiming that it might raise three and a half billion. Is that the number that uh, springs to well, your mind? Well, I think you'll find it's not just the Labour Party. Mm -hmm. The London School of Economics okay. have assessed it as 3.2 billion. The IFS have said three billion. Okay. And I think Warwick Business School had 3.6 billion. Or are these people not reputable people who you should accept their assessments. I've, I've asked for that to be looked at. My point was different, actually. It is that I understand that uh, non-DOMs pay in tax 
uh, of all the taxes that they do pay, around £8 billion of tax a year. So um, I want to make sure that wealthy foreigners pay as much tax in this country as possible. Um, Ireland has a non-DOM regime. France has a non-DOM regime. Um, these are people who are highly mobile, and I want to make sure that we don't do anything that inadvertently loses us more money than we raise. Yes, but we already know that the London School of Economics has done precisely that piece of work with anonymised data from HMRC, and they assess that 100 non-DOMs would leave the UK um, if uh, that loophole was closed. That's not exactly a, a huge exodus, is it? Well, I want to be sure that there are no dynamic effects that mean that we lose more income than we gain. And if I could point out that, you know, I think if you look at the budget as a whole, we very much did deliver on that commitment that asks people with the broadest shoulders to bear the heaviest burden. If you look at what we did with the 45p tax rate, uh, tax rate pairs, if you look at what we did on income tax as a whole, um, and if, hang on, let me finish. We know how the we know how the non-dom double whammy works. So if you uh, don't pay tax in the UK on your money that you earn abroad, as long as you don't spend it in the UK, so actually we're getting hit twice. We're not getting the tax, mm. and we're not getting the spend. How does it make any sense to carry on in that way? We are getting a lot of spend because, as I understand it, the spend that we get brings in about £8 billion a year, which is a lot. And I just want to make sure that anything you do uh, in terms of the non-DOM tax regime doesn't mean that you lose more than you gain. Yeah. And this is a really interesting concept, isn't it? When it comes to the super-rich, we always want to give concessions, whether it's the non-DOM tax loophole, whether it's charitable status for private schools, whether it's the li lifting the cap on bankers' bonuses. So incentives for the rich and responsibility for the police sergeant, the senior ward sister, or the school head of year who will be brought into higher tax bans through your frozen thresholds. Isn't it the case there's one rule for the rich and another rule for everybody else? No. Um, and I do understand the picture you're trying to paint, but if I could just say it I'm is... I'm painting it. It's it, well, real. I'm just saying, if you'd let me answer very kindly, um, I understand the picture you're trying to paint, but it is 180 degrees wrong. Look at what <laughs> we did in that autumn statement. We increased taxes on wealthier people, but when it came to poorer people, we Not up. The hey, could you possibly let me finish? Not the Would, if you could let me finish, That's I will. Well, I let you answer, ask the question. So I think it's reasonable you should let me answer it. We increased taxes on the wealthiest. When it came to the poorest people, you can see we uprated benefits by inflation. That's an 11 billion pound commitment. We respected the triple lock, which reaches a lot of pensioners on low incomes. Uh, we uh, have a very generous energy price guarantee, about £900 per household, um, £500 next year, a £900 payment for everyone on means-tested benefits. There was a huge range of measures, which means the most vulnerable people in our society, when you add up the increase in the national living wage, the benefits uprate, uh, the cancellation of the health and social care levy, the support with fuel duty, this is thousands of pounds going to some of the poorest people in the country, and I think that reflects our values as a nation. Um, but at the same time as doing all of that, I believe that it was very important that we avoided doing things uh, that might be politically charged but would have been damaging to our long-term growth. And my concern about what you're proposing on non-DOMs is that it would cost us more money than it would make us. You know that the research suggests that it wouldn't. £3.2 billion, midwives, nurses, primary school breakfast clubs. I think I know what side of the divide I'm on. I think I know what side of the divide I'm on because uh, midwives, nurses all got uh, a lot of extra money for the NHS. Uh, people in schools, there was a big increase in funding for schools. Uh, people on low income, there was a huge amount of effort to make sure we help people through a very difficult time. And when it comes to measures on wealthier people that we know will actually increase the money coming into the Treasury, we took those measures. 
where we weren't sure if it was damaging to economic growth, we held back, and for very good reason. Thank you, Siobhan. And Chancellor, I think you have published a distributional impact overall on households, and perhaps you want to just refer to where that's published. Um, I think it's published in the autumn statement document. It's, it's, uh, it's a separate document that's published alongside, which does does show that the measures announced um, in the autumn statement are progressive, with the top decile paying uh, the most, certainly in cash terms, and uh, more uh, than, I think it's quite hard to read the, the diamonds, but um, it, is, it is very progressive and in terms of the overall impact. And could you just name that uh, document, it's, it's Dan, the, um, so that people can Google it? Yeah, yeah. it's the impact uh, on households, the distributional analysis uh, accompanying the awesome statement. Thank you. Vanessa. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you Siobhan. Emma. Uh, thank you, Chair. Afternoon, Chancellor. I'd be super grateful if you were able to give quality but short answers <laughs> to my questions. Give quality but short answers. Quality but short, please, because I've just, I've just got a few. Um, you'll be aware that there are serious concerns about falling real pay across the public sector. And while the pay review bodies have responsibility for recommending pay awards for many public sector workers, their remit is guided by affordability, which is as defined by guidance received by the Treasury. So it would be therefore helpful to know at this point what provision you've made for public sector pay growth in the departmental settlements that you set out in the autumn statement. That's a process that's ongoing with departments at the moment, so I can't give you an answer. When you made your autumn statement, and obviously I think one of the colleagues is going to talk about um, departmental spending, was any of that departmental spending you allocated put aside, recognising that there would be public sector uh, pay growth? We always uh, make uh, allocations recognising what pay awards are likely to be. I just don't know what those numbers are, are at the moment because we've had this very big growth in inflation recently and so uh, we're having to work through all those numbers. The, the wisdom but you're just not sure what there is at the moment. No, we're going through a process to work out what those numbers should be given the recent uh, peak in inflation. Okay, and you'll be aware that increasing number of public sector workers are considering industrial action at the moment, and this is obviously as a result of the cost of living crisis and the difficulty many of them are finding uh, making work pay. Will you agree to meet with the unions to discuss their pay issues in the public sector and understand the pressure that members are under? Well, the um, responsibility for engaging with unions, which I, I strongly encourage, rests with the relevant Secretary of State. I know, for example, in health, Steve Barclay has been engaging uh, very frequently with um, the RCN, and I think that is very important. And I think we recognise as a government that uh, there are real pressures on people's spending power caused by inflation, and what we have to do is to... Uh, respect the PRB process because that's fair and it's independent and often when I was health secretary they would rule in a way that um, was very very difficult for the NHS budgets but at the same time not do anything that means that the inflation problem that we have gets worse and stays for longer. Would you as Chancellor at least meet with the TUC or some of the representatives just to hear from members personally about the difficulties they're facing? I'm very happy to meet with the head of the TUC. Thank you very much. Um, the autumn statement obviously froze income tax uh, thresholds. Do you know how many more people now are going to be paying income tax because of that freeze? I don't have the number in front of me, but I can certainly write to you and let you know. Thank you. Would you be also able to, either in writing or let me know, how many families will see their tax uh, child credit withdrawn because of that freeze in income? Happily do so. Thank you. On tax, hopefully we'll all agree, Chair, that getting people to pay what they owe is a good thing. Um, so I just want to look at, looking back at the autumn statement, you allocated a further £79 million over the next five years to HMRC in order to tackle tax fraud, which works out £15.8 million a year. The Department for Work and Pensions is set to receive an extra £280 million between now and 2024 to tackle fraud, error and debt in the benefits system, which works out at £112 million a year. And the government have calculated that over the course of five years, this £79 million HMRC investment sees a return of £725 million. That's an investment gain of four, uh, £646 million, which as a percentage is a return of 818% return on investment in tax fraud. So, Chancellor, what was the reasoning behind the decision to allocate more money to benefits fraud, which has a lower yield, and less money to tax fraud, when it has a much higher yield? 
Um, we want to stamp out all fraud, wherever it is, because there shouldn't be any at all, and we allocate money based on what uh, the relevant department, whether it's DWP or whether it's HMRC, say they need to bring down fraud in their areas. Now, um, in, in the case of DWP, it is a, a more intensive process uh, with, on, aver was, uh, if, on average, uh, smaller sums of money. But it is where there is fraud, we should stamp it out. And I think that applies in all areas of government spending. I totally agree with the decision to stamp out fraud. My point was, if you tackle tax fraud, you get a 818% return, which is much higher than tackling benefit fraud, but more money went into tackling benefit fraud than this tax fraud. It seems if, Sorry, I, just to reassure you, there is no ideology in this. If HMRC said that they could get the same again with the same money again, they would get it. We want that money. So all the, just to add, the, the figures for how much we get are things which the OBR scrutinise, and obviously we always try and persuade them that we can, you know, if, if we invest, make additional investments, we'll be able to achieve more in terms of HMRC uh, collecting more tax um, or DWP uh, uh, preventing more fraud. But ultimately, that is one of the constraints in that the, the, there is a there is a point at which they say, well, the additional money will not get additional yield, or and okay. so, so so there is a sort of OBR process that we have to go through here as well. Thank to recognise the revenue. But last month, during a public account committee oral evidence session, Jim uh, Hara, the head of HMRC, said, I quote, on average, for every pound that we spend in our customer compliance group, we recover about £18 worth of additional tax revenues. He said that in the public accounts committee, that for every pound, he can get 40, uh, 18 pounds back and tax watch have found hmrc estimates that in 2020 to 21 32 billion pounds of tax went on collected 45 percent of that is a result of fraud and tax watch believe that these numbers are certainly an underestimate so why only give 79 million when the head of the hmrc is saying for every pound you give me i can get 18 pounds back when we've got all these problems with budgets, we've got departmental cuts, we've got public sector uh, potentially not getting the pay rise they need, why not give more money to tackle tax fraud? Well, if you're trying to suggest that we have not done everything we possibly can uh, to reduce yeah, tax yeah. fraud, then I'm, I'm afraid that's mistaken. We are Lowercase. cracking down with HMRC, we're cracking down with DWP on benefits fraud, the costs of doing so are different in different sectors, but we assess each case on the basis of how much money they need to do the job, and that's why those numbers are what they are. I wasn't suggesting that. I was quoting from the head of the HMRC who said, on average, for every pound we spend in our customer compliance group, we recover about £18. And when a government is looking for additional money, it seems a little nonsensical to put more money into uh, lower yield in benefits fraud and not put more money into tax fraud when that generates so much more income for the government? Well, um, that's why he got an extra £79 million, and I hope he maintains that 18 to 1 ratio. Um, and if he can uh, do even better, then I'll obviously consider giving him even more money, because I think it's very, very important that we do that. I think he would welcome that. And um, just finally, uh, Chair, thank you. The OBR forecasts a cumulative 7.1% fall in real disposable household income over 21-22 to 23-24, uh, which is by some way the largest on record. I do recognise that the energy price guarantee and cost of living payments reduce that fall uh, by about a quarter. But is a fall in household disposable incomes inevitable? <laughs> well, I think when you look at the, what the OBR themselves say in terms of the three global shocks that we've been dealing with in the last 15 years, but two global shocks in the last three years, um, then unfortunately it's not particularly surprising that you see a fall in disposable income. And I think it's our responsibility as a government to do everything we can to help people through a difficult patch, which is why... Yes, they say that we reduce that fall in living standards by a quarter, um, but the thing that is actually more important is that over the next year, we reduce it by a half, um, which is the, the time that I think people are going to be in the most difficulty because that's the forecast recession period. Um, and I think that is what we should be doing as a government, to do everything we can to cushion people through difficult times. Which I accept, but... How can a fiscal policy that reduces household incomes be justified in a cost of living crisis? 
Well, it's, that isn't our fiscal policy. If you remember, the OBR said that the measures I took in the autumn statement reduced the impact of the recession uh, by a full 1% of GDP, um, saved 70,000 jobs. So we have acted to help people through a very difficult period. Could, could I just add on that? I mean, yeah. th there are two other things I would say. One is is the biggest driver, as the ABR says, is the, the rise in energy prices. And because we're a net importer of energy, that is a kind of cost to the economy. And the, the figures that they present are economy-wide figures. Within that, though, of course, the decisions that were made in the autumn statement affected how the distribution of that average fallen household disposable income was shared as demonstrated in the distributional analysis. So the, what the government could do through the policy was to change where some of that burden fell and skew that more towards the higher income deciles and pri provide more support at the bottom. So that's an average rather than a specific income by income hit. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Dan. And uh, Anne-Marie, I think you're next. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Chancellor, the support on energy bills was very welcome, albeit generally at a lower level. Uh, and certainly uh, what you've done for specific help to vulnerable groups. But I think commentators have observed that there are two particular problems. Because the extra support is linked to means-tested benefits, it means that about 40% of lower income families who are not on benefits don't get support. And the second uh, comment uh, which commentators have raised is that the the way the uh, £900 um, it support effectively uh, works, if you're on universal credit, um, then you get the lot. If you're on £1 the wrong way, then you don't. Um, it might be fairer, or perhaps better, to spread it so that that test, are you or are you not eligible, comes in different tranches rather than one-off, and hopefully you'll tell me that maybe that is your um, proposal. And I think that the other concern we have is the unintended consequence of linking this benefit to universal credit. So there's a disincentive to work more hours, which will take you outside, uh, if you like, that, that, that cut-off, which means you will lose quite a considerable sum of money. I recognise those concerns. And I don't think it's the right... It, if we have these high energy prices uh, for the long term, if they're here to stay, we've been talking about the forecast before, then I don't think uh, doing that support through the benefit system is the optimal way of doing it. I would point out, of course, that you can work on universal credit. So by targeting to on people on universal credit, you are not... Excuse me. <coughs> you are not just targeting it on... Uh, people who are out of work. Oh, absolutely. Um, but um, I do recognise the point you make. I think the challenge we had, or have, is that if we want to help people quickly, the benefit system is a way that we can do that. We, we know who everyone is. Um, we have a good idea of their circumstances, the people who we're helping through the benefit system. So it is an efficient way to get people help quickly. But what I said in my comments in the autumn statement is that whilst we'll be using that system this year and next year, uh, from April 24 we want to work towards a social tariff or social discount approach whereby we reach pe all people equally on low incomes. That means a lot of complicated work to marry the information held by HMRC with the information held by DWP on benefits um, and that's a very big operational challenge, but that's the direction of travel we want to go. So might that also impact your thinking on the pensioner benefit, which currently is universal? Yes. Um, one of the things that the uh, OBR uh, makes very clear is that the affordability of all of this depends very much on what actually happens to energy prices. And they've suggested that this particular scheme um, in, a, in a scenario could cost another 71 billion and they give a scenario uh, in, in terms of where energy prices might land up uh, and I think there's two concerns one is where would you find the extra money but two if I think about uh, householders if that happens do you still stand by the guarantee and the scheme the specific support scheme you put in place to the, the to the time to the deadline that you currently set so people aren't concerned uh, as to what might happen if energy prices go up during the next couple of years? 
Well, as things stand, you're absolutely right to point to the, um, the high costs. It's probably going to cost around 80 billion this year and uh, possibly around half that next year. And we do stand behind what we've offered. We think it's very important that we give people security that what we've promised we will deliver. But um, in the long run, we are going to need everyone to help us crack this problem if we're not going to have a huge additional um, burden on taxpayers, which ultimately will lead to the kind of high taxes that um, I certainly don't believe are desirable in the long run going forward. And so what we're really saying is that we will always be there to help poorer households. Um, the way we do it will change, and that's why we talk about a social tariff or a social discount. But for most people, we need you to play your part in reducing our energy dependency on what Putin chooses to do in Ukraine. And that's why we've got this national ambition to reduce energy consumption by 15%. The EU ambition is 13%. We're a couple of percent higher, but other countries are doing the same kind of thing. And that isn't just at a national level, but that's for every household. And we think that the £500 that we're offering to help people save next year at current gas prices, if people did the 15%, they could save that £500 themselves in the amount they pay in the years that follow. So we're trying to help people to help themselves. We're giving them a cushion this year and next, but we do need people to change their behaviour. And with regard to businesses, I think you said there would be a more targeted approach. Now, I appreciate, uh, I don't expect you to tell us today what that's going to be, but I'd like to understand what do you mean by targeted and what sort of criteria are you looking at? Because their support is much more limited um, and a number of them have ended in some fairly um, uh, difficult fixed-term contracts uh, at very high rates. Well, I would say that... Um you know, limited is perhaps not the right word to use to describe the support we're giving businesses this year. It's probably going to cost about £18 billion, which is huge support for businesses. Um, we will have a scheme that is generous next year, not on that scale, but we will have generous support for businesses next year. Um, and we're going through the process of how that's going to work, but we are particularly thinking about businesses that might be vulnerable to those high prices, so smaller <coughs> businesses in particular and also larger businesses in energy intensive industries so we're in the process of designing that we want to design it as quickly as we can it just wasn't possible to do it in time for last Thursday. That is good to hear Charles so one final question and that is um, the fixed uh, price contracts that both individuals and uh, businesses have entered into they've entered into them some of them at the peak uh, for two to five years they are tied into them and the, if you like the, the whole uh, autumn statement and the OBR commentary assumes that energy prices will come down in 24-25 and while the wholesale price is coming down, uh, the retail <coughs> price clearly because energy companies have bought, bought ahead is not uh, and we may well find that, that those who have entered into five year fixed term contracts are very heavily penalised. Is there anything that you could do, might you think about doing to help those people trapped through no fault of their own who entered into fixed term contracts because that was the only way they could then uh, qualify for the government support? Well, we, um, I don't think as a government we can be in the business of uh, second guessing the, the decisions that people make with their own individual energy suppliers. But what we can do is say we're going to help you this year with a two and a half thousand pound cap, we're going to help you next year with a three thousand pound cap. We're going to help you conserve the energy you use, um, and for the poorest people, we'll try and find a more effective structure than we're able to do at short notice um, to help them going forward. But we are saying to people that in the end, everyone is going to have to take responsibility for their energy bills, and they're going to have to think about how they reduce their energy consumption because. It is a national mission to make sure that we can't be blackmailed by people like Putin uh, when they do things that inter interrupt international energy supplies. And you know we've done extremely well as a country to get up to 40% of our supply through renewables and nuclear. And we announced a very big investment in nuclear at the autumn statement with Sizewell C. 
Um, so there's a, a long-term process to make sure that we have permanent, cheap, green supply of energy, which is very, very important for everyone. But as we get there, we're going to need everyone's help. I think my final comment, Charles, would be, I think you need to recognise, for some people, their energy bills have gone up from hundreds of pounds to tens of thousands of pounds. Some of our businesses have come with many hundred percent plus increases that is the sort of bill it will take out one of my businesses it will take out 25 percent of all of their of their profit that's unsustainable so with respect i think there are some very specific issues around these fixed price contracts which i do think the government has some responsibility because that was part of the the term to get the benefit the government offered to look at them, to look at what they might be able to do working with the suppliers, the energy companies, to bring some sort of sense to what would be a very perverse consequence if the energy companies actually came out of this actually making a lot of money on the backs of people who can ill afford it. If you'd like to write, with me, write to me with the details of that, I'm very happily look into it as we construct our package for next year. Thank you, appreciate it, Charles. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Thank you very much. And, and to Anne-Marie's question about the £900, we took evidence, I think it was from the Resolution Foundation, saying that it would be better to spread that £900 into smaller payments. Is that something you're planning to do, or will it be a binary, you get the 900 and then the next day you don't? No, so I think the, the, the intention, um, and this will be for DWP to set out, like mm. the one-off payments this year, mm. where they were um, the £650 was made in two, mm. two separate yeah. payments with two different eligibility dates, recognising mm. the fact that people move in and out of eligibility as they mm. claim or move yeah. off universal credit, for example. So um, we, okay. we haven't specified how... Maximum we haven't, of two? Well, I think that is a decision yet to be made. Okay. We, we haven't made... Uh, I, and I think we'll discuss with DWP and they'll on that. set out but indefinite I, I, I don't think it will be one payment okay. Thanks so much Alison Thank you very much Chair and just to pick up on uh, where Anne-Marie left off Tory Glen Community Base a community hall in my constituency are seeing their gas bill go up from £9,700 to £62,000 they can't afford that and I would urge you to consider them within uh, what you're looking at for energy bills Absolutely, but they are the people that we're helping this year with our, uh, with our energy price guarantee. £18 billion of support across the country, um, so it's very, very significant help, and we will be giving very significant help next year. But if you're saying we need to think hard about the long-term impact, then I absolutely agree. Thank you. Um, can I ask about the energy efficiency plans that you had in the statement? Why is the £6 billion in new funding for energy efficiency only going to be available from 2025? Because we're spending, uh, I think it's £6.6 .6 billion in this parliament up until that point, and I decided this was very important to extend the programme, and also because I was advised that there are very severe supply chain constraints with things like the supply of um, cavity wall insulation and solar panels. And so the right way to boost the supply of, and deal with those supply chain constraints is to stage the investment. I mean, it's not much of a national mission if you have to wait three years for it. Well, you're, that would be the case if we weren't spending any money now, but we are. The, could I just add the other thing that was announced in the growth plan in is proceeding is uh, an exchequer funded increase in the eco scheme which is where the energy suppliers do the sorry um uh do the do the insulation measures themselves or the energy efficiency measures themselves so there was an additional billion over the next couple of years um funded by the exchequer via energy companies the chair of the environmental audit committee has said that the numerous schemes can be confusing to consumers to know what they're eligible for and the stop, stop start approach of programs over the years has bruised industry and that talks to some of the supply chain issues actually that you're finding that industry hasn't had that predictability of these schemes so that they could invest properly um, are there plans to simplify these schemes into something that consumers can understand better uh, and how can how will you avoid uh, a further uh, scandal like the helms green deal scandal well, I think uh, that's something that my colleague Grant Chaps is going to be announcing the whole scheme. I wanted to uh, uh, announce the broad outlines of the strategy, a big push towards energy independence, renewables and nuclear, a big push towards energy efficiency with this uh, you know, £12 billion pounds investment, uh, this parliament and the next. So um, we, we will be announcing a plan. But 
yes, I want this to be a very straightforward offer for families that uh, we're asking to take these measures themselves. Um, I want it to be very straightforward for them to know exactly what they need to do to improve their energy efficiency. And for families that we're helping because they're on low incomes, uh, I want it to be very straightforward for them to know how we're going to help them. Yeah. Many families just don't have the spare cash right now and won't have for some time to invest in that. Well, that's one of the reasons why we're putting so much extra money into it. Okay. Uh, you mentioned the, the, the notion of energy independence. Uh, EDF, who the government are working with in size well, see are French. That's not really UK energy independence. Well, uh, let me be clear. Um, it's going to be a nuclear power plant in Britain supplying uh, the equivalent of the power for, that needed by six million homes. So um, I have absolutely no problem with um, uh, foreign ownership of some of our National key... Uh, would you let me finish? Uh, of, of some of our key energy infrastructure, providing it is consistent with national security concerns. And I think you have to get the balance right. But I think if we want to move to energy independence, we should welcome investment from the best companies all over the world who can help us do that. No okay. Uh, where is the fuel from for nuclear power stations so strong? Uh, you'll have to ask nuclear experts on that, but I'll happily write to you with some information. It's not the UK, is it? So that's not independence either. Well, um, when I talk about independence, I'm not talking about uh, cutting ourselves off from the rest of the world, cutting ourselves off from our friends and allies. Um, I think we have to work together with fellow democracies to deal with the fact that we have all discovered that we are extremely vulnerable to what dictators like Putin do in countries like Ukraine, and we have to work together to insulate ourselves from those threats. But that means working closely with countries like Norway, the European Union, the United States, so that we can deal with these challenges together. And really, you're moving from, from dependence on Putin for fuel to some other, organ some other country or some other regime for nuclear materials. That's um, not independence. Well, Okay, uh, you and I have different definitions of what independence is, but uh, I, imagine, I appreciate that independence is your specialist chosen topic in life generally, but when I'm talking about energy independence, I'm talking about making sure that our energy supplies come from sources that we can trust. And uh, that means nuclear generated in this country, it means renewables, and it means where there are international flows from friends and allies that we can trust. Uh, going a wee bit further on the, the issue of nuclear and size well C, that's not going to come on stream for quite some time, and you've got very poor record in delivering this when you consider that Hinkley is already significantly overdue and about £26 billion over budget. Well, I do think that we take too long to deliver major infrastructure projects. That was the comment I made earlier. And we need to do what we can to improve that track record, although I think actually other countries have similar issues when they're delivering nuclear power plants. Um, you'll hear about our nuclear strategy when the business secretary makes his announcement. Um, but that's why renewables are a very important part of this uh, plan as well. Why was there no announcement in your statement, for example, on increasing the renewable capacity in Scotland, uh, and in particular, uh, increasing funding to projects like carbon capture and storage in the North East, the ACORN project, because if that were taken off the reserve list, that could make a significant impact. Well, we have um, increased uh, our supply from renewables by more than any other large European country. I think we're second only to Germany in terms of the total proportion of our energy that comes from renewables, about 40%. So it's a record that I'm very proud of because this government has uh, really blazed a trail internationally. Um, but uh, is there more we can do? Absolutely, and you'll hear that from the business secretary when he makes his announcement. Will you take carbon capture and storage off the reserve list? Carbon capture and storage is extremely important, but if you are asking me where I think the biggest gap in our strategy is at the moment, it's actually nuclear. I think we've, we've done well on renewables, we need to do even better, but uh, we need to make more progress on nuclear. How much additional cost will go into bills for individual bill payers from investment in nuclear? Well, um, the, the whole purpose of this plan is to reduce bills by giving people plentiful access to cheap green energy in time. But we are very aware that this is 
you know, a decades-long project. We have a national ambition, a national promise, uh, a commitment to get to net zero by 2050, and this is a very, very important part of that. It will add a levy onto people's bills, though, won't it? Well, we have levies on people's bills at the moment to um, pay for this transition, and uh, we recognise that that's going to be one of many ways. It's also going to be investment by taxpayers from central funds, uh, the Sizewell C announcement is about £700 million of taxpayers' funds, so there'll be funding from many different sources. Can I ask you a question? Is £1.7 billion or £1.5 billion a larger figure? <coughs> I, think, uh, I think you know. You and I both know the answer to that. Do, can you just explain why you're asking it? So in this year's Scottish Government budget, John Swinney has identified um, £1.7 billion pounds uh, that the budget is worth less because of inflationary pressures. You have said that the Scottish Government will get £1.5 billion over the next two years and bar not consequentials. Well, um, the truth is that every government department, every devolved administration, uh, every family actually in Scotland and the whole of the UK is having to deal with inflationary pressures that we face. And the number one thing we can do, and the number one thing we can do to help John Swinney is to bring down those inflationary pressures, which is why I hope that behind the scenes, even if not publicly, you and he will welcome the fact that we had a very strong package of measures that the OBR say is going to reduce inflation. ...services in the NHS, but also stave off the prospect of staffing cuts that head teachers are predicting. Well, I hope so. Um, Amanda Pritchard, the Chief Executive of NHS England, said that she believed that the, the package that we announced for the NHS and social care should be enough to deal with uh, the pressures that she's facing. Um, the campaigners for schools uh, ahead of the autumn statement were saying that they believed they needed £2 billion, which actually the IFS confirms restores funding in schools to above 2010 levels mm. per head. Um, so I very much hope so. Fine. Can, I, can I therefore move us on to defence? In your autumn statement, you, you did not commit to increase defence spending. Um, why was that? Well, we did say very clearly um, that both I and the Prime Minister believe that defence spending needs to increase. We recognise the very real pressures. My views on this are obviously in the public domain because I was on the back benches um, and I talked about my strong belief that we need to increase uh, defence spending as a proportion of GDP. So I think my views on that are on the record. But um, I think it's very important when you're responsible for taxpayers' funds to know what it is that you're buying. And we have this process that you will be very aware of called the Integrated Review. Um, it led to the largest sustained increase of funding, £16 billion from memory, since the Cold War, when it was announced by the then Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Um, and that was written, though, before Ukraine. And so I think we need to go through a process to update that. But I was very clear in my autumn statement, this was not pushing things to the right. I wanted that process to be complete ahead of the spring budget. Do you think, I mean, your views are on the record, as are a number of other ministers, including the defence <coughs> front bench. But do you think there's a general acceptance within government um, at the very core of government, that given events in Ukraine, given events um, in uh, geopolitical events generally, it's, it's an increasingly unstable world out there, that there is a value in increasing defence spending on a sustainable basis, if only to act as a deterrence, um, um, because that war is very expensive at the end of the day. Yes, I do. Um, and I also believe, having been Foreign Secretary for a year, that it's one of the biggest ways that Britain can make a contribution to global peace and prosperity mm. because we have absolutely superb armed forces respected throughout the world, second largest military in NATO, um, and uh, hugely experienced armed forces who've been involved in conflicts in Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Bosnia, yeah. um, and so on. So I think. There's a very important contribution that we can make as a global citizen in defending democracy, open societies, and the rule of law. Brilliant. And final question, if I may. Um, hard power, very important, but so is soft power. Um, 
as you well know, have a former foreign secretary, work at the British Council, the BBC World Service, and so forth, invaluable in, in promoting understanding and trust over time. Um, could I make a plea that you continue with that focus as well now as Chancellor, given the importance of, of soft power in, in trying to avoid the use of hard power at the end of the day? The, the two come as a team, but you always tried the soft power first. Well, David Cameron used to use the phrase that we are a soft power superpower. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think it's something where we, we have enormous uh, cultural reach around the world. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very important in terms of Britain's role as a force for good in the world. So I absolutely recognise the case you're making. Thank you. Thank you, John. Danny. Thanks very much. Um, Chancellor, uh, earlier in the session you mentioned that £8 billion pounds is going into health and social care and you stressed the importance of getting good value for money from that. Um, and I think you said the way to do that is through real public service reform. So I'm very pleased to hear that because I think that one of the, perhaps the only tragedy uh, of the Brexit years was the, uh, the loss of focus on public service reform which had preceded 2016. I mean, the, the, the government that you were part of uh, it, it, uh, under David Cameron set a whole train of reforms in, in, pl in place. I'd like to see an the return to that. Can you just flesh out what you think, what you mean by public service reform? I mean, you mentioned Patricia Hewitt, delighted to draw on the expertise of, of, of the Blair era, uh, but what do you think she's going to be, what are you tasking her to do? And crucially, do you agree with me that the, the, the great objective should be to reduce demand on the state rather than just improve the efficiency of the supply? And how do we achieve that? Well, I think it's right to start with the NHS because that's the biggest single area where we can see demand going up because of an ageing population, new medicines coming on stream, you know, very big pressures. Um, but there's also the biggest opportunity and um, the real heart of that uh, is actually to move to prevention rather than cure to tackle diseases upstream. If you diagnose a cancer at stage one or two, it's much cheaper than stage three or four and patient is much more likely to live. So all sorts of reasons why you would want to do that. Um, the pandemic obviously meant the NHS had to focus on an immediate priority to make sure people with COVID got the life-saving treatment they need and we're incredibly grateful to them for what they did. Um, actually public service reform did continue because Matt Hancock as health secretary piloted the health and care bill through the House of Commons and the Integrated Care Boards, yes. it's a technical name, but that basically it's designed to bring together health and care systems locally so they can focus on prevention and not cure. Um, the reason that uh, the Health Secretary and I asked Patricia Hewitt to do this review is because she's actually running one of those Integrated Care Boards <laughs> in Norfolk and Waveney. She's obviously very experienced um, as a former Health Secretary. And we wanted to make sure these new local NHSs work, and she's very committed to tackling waste and inefficiency and to making sure that we empower local NHSs in the same way that we empower heads of schools to be creative, uh, use their freedoms to really make change happen on the ground. I have a concern that I, you know, is, is no secret because uh, I've written about it publicly many times that we have more targets in the NHS than any other healthcare system in the world. I think that actually stops the NHS being efficient um, and so I'm hoping that Patricia Hewitt's review will help us to move in the right direction. I mean I completely applaud the ambition of the, of the ICBs and the idea of not only integrating but localising that their health and social care system is absolutely right so thank you for that. Um, just, just lastly uh, on education or more broadly skills and welfare major priority here I mean do you not agree that in order A to save money and to great value for the taxpayer and to deliver the transition that we need. It, you know, we mentioned insulation uh, installers and so on. We need a skills revolution. You've, you've set out your ambition on that. Isn't a part of the answer to that to radically reduce HE in this country? We, should just ask, we are spending too much on putting too many young people through university. We need to be investing much more, or well, maybe taking some of that budget out and returning it to taxpayers, but balancing much more towards FE and vocational skills. Um, I don't look at it in quite that binary way. Mm -hmm. I think HE is one of our great success stories. I think we have fantastic universities. I think the 50% of school leavers who go to university on the whole get a very good education in this system, which in, in this country. 
I'm concerned about the 50% who don't. So I would say, the way I would phrase what you've just said is, I would rather I'd like to see the same revolution in quality in FE that we've had in HE, and I would like to know that every single one of our school leavers leaves with the skill levels necessary to get a decent wage and make a contribution to a modern dynamic economy. Um, it won't surprise you to know that I'm concerned that isn't the case at the moment, and that's why I commissioned a lot of work in the autumn statement to try and work out. I don't, what I don't want to do is another big review. I think we've had very good reviews. We've got very good policies in place like T-levels, lifelong learning entitlements, boot camps, uh, the white paper. But I want to understand, you know, in the end, put all these things together and are we going to be giving our young people the same skills that they were getting uh, Germany or Japan? Um, and if not, what do we need to do to change it? Thank you. Thank you so much, Danny. Angela. Thank you very much, Chancellor. Um, this year alone, your party has given us three prime ministers, four chancellors, four different versions of a Conservative government, and six fiscal events. 147 members of the government, including 32 cabinet ministers, have resigned or been sacked. What effect do you think this chaos has had on our economic prospects and our international reputation? Well, I wish we hadn't had that level of instability. Um, but um, I produced an autumn statement that is designed to restore economic stability and consistency of economic policy making. And I hope we can turn the page on all that instability. But it's had a detrimental effect, hasn't it? I mean, it's well, it's, you know, it's, it's not something anyone would wish for. Um, but I would say that um, if you look at what the OBR is saying, if you look at what the OECD is saying, the primary cause for the economic challenges we face are the two big shocks of a pandemic and an energy crisis. Uh, that's what other countries are facing as well. There are, you know, Germany, um, Holland, Italy has higher inflation than we have. So I think it's wrong to say that this is somehow a uniquely UK issue in terms of the economic instability. I think everyone accepts that there are economic shocks around, but doesn't that mean it's an even more silly time to be as self-indulgent as we've seen um, in governance your party deliver at that crucial time when there are these shocks? Well, as I say, I wish we hadn't had that instability, but I think it's wrong to say that the economic issues that we're dealing with are primarily as a result of that. I think that, uh, you know, if you look at this year, and I've just counselled against taking one year snapshots, but you just talked about all the instability we've had in one year. That happens to be the year where we've got the fastest growth in the G7, so that's why I would hesitate to draw too many comparisons. I right, see so you're possibly arguing that we should do this every year as a growth <laughs> <laughs> I'll be pleased to know I'm not yeah. arguing that. Um, it wasn't mentioned in the autumn statement, but you've retained a planned cut in the surcharge on bank profits down from 8% to 3%, and that constitutes an £18 billion giveaway to the banks over the next five years at a time when rising interest rates will make them more profitable. Um, do you think that as real living standards are set to plummet by 7% in the next two years, that this is a fair choice that you've made? Yes, and I'll tell you why. Because I made a decision in the autumn statement that I was not going to do things as far as I could possibly avoid it that damage economic growth. Uh, what banks are paying, and the reason for that change in the rate, is because we are at the same time increasing corporation tax from 19% to 25%. If you add in the 3% surcharge, they are paying higher profits. Are they, uh, if you add in the, the surcharge as it is, they are paying higher uh, marginal rates on their profits than in other European countries. Uh, and so I don't want them to move their operations out of London. I want them to contribute, continue to contribute uh, to the Exchequer because I want them to help fund the NHS and schools and all the very important public services that we want. Okay, so to date, um, uh, today's bill as well, 50 MPs on your own side have signed a hostile amendment to the levelling up bill which is being discussed um, on the floor of the House which would abolish mandatory house building targets and the government appears to be backing down from putting those targets into position. Um, 
This has been dubbed by the author of the Tory manifesto in 2019 that destroy the planning system to make the recession worse amendment. So are you going to face down the rebels in order uh, to help growth or are you going to give in to them? And if you give in, how can you claim that the government can make the right decisions for our economy and tackle the housing shortage if it's not going to stand up to this kind of pressure? Well, this is Michael Goh's policy area, so I can't tell you um, exactly what his decision is going to be with respect to specific amendments to the levelling up bill. But what I can say is that we are very aware of the difficulty that young people have getting onto the housing ladder. Um, and we are also very aware of shortcomings in the planning system. And I think the, the root problem that I as Chancellor have to look at is the way that incentives are not aligned across the planning system. Um, and I think that we do need to ask ourselves why it is that the way our planning rules work often sets local communities against the national need to build more houses and how we can improve that. And that's certainly something that I'll be looking at. How does the Treasurer assess the impact on economic growth of lower housing supply as a result of the scrapping of targets, if that were, what to, were to happen? We're not just aware of the impact on economic growth. We're also aware on the, of the impact on thousands of young people if they can't get onto the housing ladder. Or move to where the jobs might mm. be. Indeed. In a reasonable way. So are you doing that assessment? We, we, I, we are always keeping that under review. It's a very, very important part of um, macroeconomic policy. Now, um, I want to ask a question about the cost of the um, bulb bailout, because the OBR has reported that the cost of bailing out bulb energy is now a colossal £6.5 billion, which is more than £200 per UK household. There's very little available information on that, and in fact, we were erroneously given um, a cost here and asked not to publish it a couple of months back. Um, that cost was £4 billion. It's now gone up to 6.5 billion. Uh, so how are these losses made up? And are you expecting them to go any higher? And why on earth is there so much secrecy mm. about it? Well, rather than giving you a second uh, piece of erroneous information, uh, can I write to you and give you more detailed information on that? I appreciate it. it's a very important issue. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Chancellor. Um, I wanted to ask about, um, about fuel duty and vehicle excise uh, taxes, because we've just had a, a and, and in fact the Chair has written to you uh, about this, a letter that was published the, the, the minute this session started. In your, um, in the Treasurer's response to the uh, jobs, growth and productivity after coronavirus report, it stated that the autumn statement brought forward measures to fight rising costs for households and businesses such as freezing fuel duty. Um, but actually, um, the OBR told us that they had taken account of the end of that freeze and also um, costed in, uh, as part of their forecast, the uh, proposed 12 pence increase in fuel duty, which will be due uh, in April. So it's now completely unclear uh, what the government's policy on fuel duty is. You've given us two versions, one in which... Um, the freeze uh, you freeze it and that carries on, but you've costed £6 billion for the cost of actually raising it by 12 pence. What, which is it? Well, the OBR is independent, so they make assumptions based on what they believe will happen. That's their job constitutionally. We want them to be independent, but uh, the truth is that fuel duties are frozen for this year until the end of March, and we will announce our decision as to what's going to happen next year at the next budget and I can't tell you what that decision is now because it hasn't been made because I don't know what the economic situation will be when it comes to the next budget but uh, we will make that decision in the way that chancellors always make that decision in the spring budget. But just to be clear if you are uh, going to freeze fuel duties going forward that's going to be six billion pounds you're going to have to find that's the cost. I think that is about the right number yes. Um, uh, you've chosen to raise taxes by freezing income tax thresholds rather than raising the rates, and you talked about that in answer to an earlier question, and this has been called the stealth tax, the so-called stealth tax. Uh, analysis shows that this hits middle earners harder 
Um, the Resolution Foundation demonstrated that someone earning £62,000 a year, for example, loses as much from these threshold freezes as someone who earns £124,000. That's £1,600. But for the lower earner, as a percentage of their earnings, it's twice as much as for the higher earner. Is this your definition of fairness? Well, I think you have to avoid taking individual measures from the budget and not look at the context of all the measures taken together. So for higher earners, we did some very specific things, reducing the threshold at which the 45p rate is payable by £25,000. That means anyone earning over £150,000 is going to pay £1,000 more tax next year. Um, and the distributional analysis shows that people on lower incomes benefit most from the measures, the decisions that I took. Um, but I did decide, yes, that I would prefer to do this through extending for two more years the freeze on thresholds than increasing the headline rates because over time, when we can afford to, I'd like to reduce those headline rates and so I didn't want to go in the opposite direction. But the one thing I would say is, uh, amongst my many failings, to say that I increase tax stealthily is not one I think you can you can really say. I've been completely open with people that taxes went up by £25 billion as a result of the autumn statement and I spelled out very clearly where that was happening. But I suppose with inflation rising at that kind of level, a uh, fiscal drag is worse. People get dragged into higher rates of tax in, in their millions and, and, and many would say, uh, even though you've said that taxes are rising, that it's not obvious uh, at what, which stage they're going to flip from the one to the other. Uh, so, yeah. uh, I understand it, that, but also over the, over in this forecasts or the OBR forecast, they actually have inflation going into negative territory. Um, so I think towards the end of the period, uh, relatively many fewer people are dragged into the higher rates. And, and just on the personal tax, know, particularly yeah. the, the personal allowance and the primary threshold, I mean, the primary threshold had a very significant increase in July this year, so it was about 9,500 and it went up to 12,570. But also, if you look over the period since 2010, because the personal allowance has uh, been doubled um, and this increase in the primary threshold, actually, even by the end of the forecast period, so 2027, 20, 28, um, someone earning £28,000 will still be paying £870 less income tax and national insurance than had we had both thresholds just risen by inflation since 2010. Yeah, be helpful. So there's a Get that clarified yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much, Thank Angela. You. And Thank you. Last but by no means least, Andrea. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Chancellor. Do you approve of retrospective taxation? In general, no. And so, do you think that the windfall taxes on electricity generators and um, also offshore offshore energy firms is retrospective? Well, um, I don't want to say something that's inaccurate, so I will write you with a precise answer to that question. But can I tell you how I approach those windfall taxes mm -hmm. more generally? So uh, I believe that they raise about £54 billion. Pounds. Um, I think that's a reasonable contribution given that this year alone we're spending £80 billion pounds to support people with their energy bills. I am absolutely against windfall taxes that aren't real windfalls, in other words, an unexpected increase in profits, because I don't want to deter investment. Um, but in the case of um, electricity generators, the, the tax that we introduced, the 45p tax that we introduced on that, is uh, when they are getting more than £75 per megawatt hour which is 50% more than the average cost of electricity over the last yeah. decade. So it's much higher than they would have expected when they yeah, made so their investment under, decision. I, I completely understand that. Sorry to cut you off, but the time is very short, and I do understand that. Do you suspect that it will reduce investment in energy infrastructure in the UK, either from the offshore energy companies or from the electricity generators? I very much hope not, because you know our oil and gas industry employs 116,000 people, more than a third of them in Scotland. Uh, they are a very important part of our transition to net zero. And what, what, what was your expectation in, in the statement? Did you just think, well, we need the money, so so be it? Or, or, or did you talk to the industry before making this decision? Well, if you, um, if you uh, your, your starting point has to be, if you don't want to deter investment, that this has to be fairly designed in a way that is 
genuinely taxing uh, the profits that people weren't expecting to make as a result of a sudden surge in global prices. And the way this has been structured is that if you invest, uh, you don't have to pay these windfall taxes. You get 91 pence in the pound back, and if it's a decarbonisation project, 109% back so you actually get more than you spend so that uh, investment allowance doesn't apply to the electricity generators does it for the electricity generators i think the key thing is that most large-scale uh, new renewables and nuclear investments are under contracts for difference and if you're within the contracts for difference uh, scheme you would not be subject to the energy generators levy so it really applies to a subset of investments which took place under the renewables obligation so under contracts for difference already if there is uh, the government commits to make good uh, yeah, no, uh, the price. I, I, I and know then, yeah, how sorry, it works. Yeah, sorry. I know how it works, but nevertheless, those electricity generators could presumably offset the, that tax liability by investing in new renewable projects under CFDs in the UK, but you're not giving them the investment allowance. For, for corporation tax, which they will pay in addition to this, they'll be able to write off their investments as they, they, they normally do, but for the new energy generators levy, no, they won't. Okay. Um, moving on, in terms of um, energy suppliers, the, those supplying to consumers and businesses, um, what plans, if any, do you have for requiring them to offer fixed rate prices to consumers? At the moment, as you'll know, very few do. And uh, they would argue that it's partly due to the collapse of energy suppliers that they can't afford to because those costs can hit them unexpectedly. So is there not a virtuous circle of treating them like banks, requiring them to have capital requirements, and also requiring them to offer fixed rate term prices to consumers and businesses to enable them to better manage their cash flows? There may be, and we are looking at the way the whole energy market functions, because it obviously hasn't been functioning in the way that we would want. Um, we've had some huge external shocks, um, you know, some huge bills have landed at the doors of taxpayers as a result, um, and, and I appreciate it's an area you know a great deal about, and we're very happy to engage with you as to the reforms that the energy market needs. Okay, well, it certainly, it, it certainly seems to me that there isn't evidence of speed of decision making coming on some of these critical areas that we have just paid in spades in our economy as a result of a failing energy market, not least of which is quick decisions on planning. Do we want grid overhead or underground, for example? And it does seem to me that the autumn statement is spending billions and billions of pounds that wouldn't have been necessary had we taken those decisions earlier. Um, well, um, that may be a fair criticism, but what I would say is that we're trying in the autumn statement to show what the solution is, and the solution is to move faster on nuclear and renewables, um, to uh, encourage energy efficiency, but also, and this is all going to be set up by the business secretary uh, very soon, to look at the fundamental reforms that we need in the energy market going forward, because, uh, you know, I. I recognise the case you make, that it hasn't been operating in the way that it needs to. Yeah. Just to completely change the subject, in terms of um, how to make our economy more productive, so on the growth side, um, there's such a dearth of women coming back into the workplace as a result of primary childcare responsibilities. It is so difficult to find good childcare and to be able to afford good childcare. So what, is, what are we doing from a productivity point of view to get more good women back into the workplace? And secondly, I have to ask you the question, investment in human potential in the early years in actually getting um, those families well established so that we don't see um, so much family breakdown that has such devastating consequences on tiny children who then go on to not be school ready. What are you doing in the Treasury to think about investing in human potential and the quality of getting women back into our economy? Well, when I delivered the autumn statement, I'd only been Chancellor for five weeks, and so I won't pretend that I was able to get to the bottom I'll of it. I'll give you the... another five weeks. Thank then, you. Okay? I, then I didn't think it would be judge. much longer, um, <laughs> but I, I, I won't pretend that I was able to get to the bottom of those issues. But what um, on both of those things, um, I pointed a direction of travel. So, um, you know, on the skills agenda, I have asked for some root and branch help in understanding if we really are equipping all our young people with the skills they need. I don't believe that will just be about further education. I think a lot of 
uh, the issues set in earlier than that and people leave primary school unable to read and write properly and often that's because of problems they had before they went to primary school. So I accept the argument of, on which you've been campaigning um, very effectively for many years. And your other point was about... Women into the women workplace, women into childcare. The, so childcare, yeah. I, I accept there is a big issue there. And um, as part of Mel Stride's review into workforce participation, we will absolutely be looking at childcare issues because, um, uh, well, you're right to highlight the problems. Yeah, but it's, it's a growth strategy. It's yes. a growth strategy to get, you know, there's, there's something, we, we, one, one in five enterprises is, is largely dominated by men. That means four in five of the potential other workers who could be generating taxes for the exchequer are simply not there. It's What's not, happening to them? Well, it's not just a growth strategy. It's actually an anti-inflation strategy because also, uh, yeah. the inability to get the labour that you need to grow your business is something that ends up with people having to pay more and charge their customers more. So um, I couldn't agree with you more. It's a very, very big issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea, and uh, thank you, Chancellor. I appreciate that this is your first time in front of the committee, that you've been in the, this chair in the Health Committee for many years. So um, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's funny to see how these tables turn, isn't it? Um, but um, you've made a number of different commitments to write to us with follow-up information, and we'll go through the transcript and make sure that we follow up with you um, so that we get the replies to you, those things that you've committed to send us. And then my final commitment that I'm going to try and get out of you is that we heard that the, from the Office of Budget Responsibility yesterday that it's written into law that their forecasts get published alongside a budget and there's a commitment to do uh, two of these a year. Now this word mini budget and fiscal event and so on has really entered the language in order to get around that commitment. Will you commit as Chancellor to uh, you know, obviously absent a major emergency like a pandemic and uh, requiring you to make fiscal changes. But as a general rule, will you be committing uh, to do those two events a year alongside an Office for Budget Responsibility report? Yes. Thank you. Chair, can I just special please, can sure. I apologise to the members and to you, Chancellor, for stepping out of this meeting. I'm chair of the all-party group for children with short lives. And our, our IGM, we heard from Sophie whose daughter Isabel is 10 and doesn't have much longer to live. And she will not be able to have her hydrotherapy sessions in the pool in her garden because of the cost of energy. Would you meet people from the APPG for Children with Short Lives to discuss the specific problems they're experiencing? I'm very happy to, but I think it might be important for the Health Secretary to meet. So let me talk uh, to you offline about which one of the two of us will be most able to help you. Thank you. Sorry, thank Chair. Thank you, Siobhan. And uh, thank you, Chancellor.